And so we wanted to move on to a panel uh, discussion, um, I guess, sort of um, exploring more the histories of uh, how the um, colonial, colonialism and empire reflected in archaeological um, practice and academia, and just try and come up with some sort of tangible um, ways forward. Um, Louise, um, you work in the same sector as me, you spoke about issues that are really kind of close to my heart, particularly um, kind of how we're defining significance. Um, and I really agree that we need to look at how um, our practice and policy that we use is uh, reinforcing structural um, inequality. There's a tendency to focus on diversity within our sector, but not the history of our practice. So I've asked Louise to, to sit on the panel spontaneously um, now. So we've got some yeah, <laughs> representation there. Um, um, yeah, so what, um, what we're going to do and how the panel will work um, is we've invited people um, to uh, just sort of give a brief statement on um, how they, they think the um, uh, histories of colonialism and empire reflected in archaeological practice and, um, and academia. Um, so um, we'll just sort of, we've already um, heard from Cathy and, and Louise, so the other people that, um, that you haven't um, heard from this morning, uh, Zina um, uh, and, and, and Niall. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll just start with some introductions. That's cool. My name's Niall Finner and I'm at the University of Winchester. I started out as an African archaeologist and then I've moved to the Caribbean and Brazil and I research community heritage in Barbados, St Vincent, um, in the Caribbean mainly. I'm Christina Welch, so I'm a religious studies scholar. Um, I, my PhD actually used a, a decolonialist research methodology, so I've been using decolonialism as a research methodology for over 20 years now. Um, and I've been working with Niall in Barbados and particularly in St Vincent. Uh, I'm Zena Kamash, uh, I'm a senior lecturer at um, Royal Holloway, uh, I'm British Iraqi um, and I self-identify as a, a white passing woman of colour um, uh, and I work on probably too many things uh, but uh, they include um, uh, trying to create a decolonial Roman archaeology um, and also a new project that I was finally allowed to announce after yesterday uh, working in Iraq um, uh, looking at the intersections between crafting and heritage for well-being for uh, people following conflict. Yeah I'm Louise Fowler so I guess there might be some people in the room because I spoke first who uh, didn't uh, know who I am so I work for MOLA Museum of London Archaeology I'm a post-excavation manager there, so I'm um, working in the development-led archaeology sector in Britain and in London, um, and I'm normally working on projects that are happening as part of um, construction schemes. Um, I'm also working uh, with colleagues and with um, Sarah Mallet from the University of Oxford on a group of objects that were collected by a photographer from the site of the Calais jungle as well and sort of exploring what looking at those objects means for kind of more commercial archaeological practice. Um, I'm Cathy Draycott, I'm uh, a lecturer in classical archaeology at Durham University in the Department of Archaeology, not classics. Um, I mostly work on art on tombs from Turkey, which is a whole other world of colonial <laughs> archaeology. Um, but I'm from Bermuda, so my talk therefore was about um, you know, my, my experiences there from, from my community and what I see and the, um, the proportions of uh, people of colour in archaeology compared to you know, my youth and my, my experiences growing up. Um, well, I um, know Niall and um, Christina from uh, Winchester University, and they um, run a course called Cultural Heritage and Resource Management. And I chose to study at Winchester because it's actually one of the only universities in this country that focuses on African and Caribbean archaeology. So I invited Niall here today to kind of, sort of um, talk about um, some of the modules that you're running, um, your motivations for running those um, modules at Winchester. Um, and, yeah, and just to talk about some of your research um, in the Caribbean at the moment, because we've um, spoke today, um, especially Louise sort of mentioned we need to kind of broaden our 
um, our concept of our borders and, and, and archaeology in that kind of sense. So that's it's really good that we've got people here today who are researching in places that would identify as British um, or British Caribbean. Okay, Laura, well, I'd, I'd probably just turn this 180 degrees and talk from another viewpoint. Mm -hmm. My other hat on is I'm the external examiner for <coughs> heritage and history at the University of the West Indies in Cave Hill, the Barbados campus. And I've had nothing to read for the last couple of years, which is alarming. The issue in the, the, the university sector in the Caribbean as a whole is that the, the funding for humanities subjects and teaching humanities subjects has been cut. So there's been a knock-on effect that fewer people are coming through to do history, heritage and archaeology in the Caribbean. And the net result is where they are trying to re-gear island economies to <coughs> heritage tourism and so forth. We're not having the local expertise coming through anymore. And that's, that's, a, sh that's a real shame. It's, it's more than a shame. Uh, you can't underestimate the real financial problems as well in a number of Caribbean islands. Barbados has just had the IMF. Um, pay a visit and help reorganise the island finances. And inevitably, when anything like this happens, it's, it's going to be things like teaching heritage, it's going to be things like galleries and creative arts, creative industries that are going to take a hit. So, so the first thing I'd say is that we, we, where I work in Barbados in St Vincent, we've got this issue where we are sort of trying to make bricks without straw in some cases. We've got a lot of good local willingness to help out. There's a lot of passion on the ground. But how does that translate to the big bucks at the top level? Well, the money's not there. So the money's not coming through. It's not going to get much easier. Um, so what we've been trying to do, and Laura was with me out in Barbados in 2016, where we were working on a digital heritage project for Barbados, which is starting <coughs> to take shape. And it, it, it's a project that... Christina and myself have adapted for our work with the Garifuna people in St Vincent and also to some extent we're trying to push out as well in another direction which is thinking in Brazil where you've got more issues of a sort of very very huge African diaspora population in Brazil that never seems to have had much of a voice culturally. So we the one thing the one element of optimism we've got I think is is using digital heritage using new approaches to trying to get people to understand their sense of place. Um, I didn't answer your question there, Laura. I just sort of kind of felt that that was important to get out there, I yeah, think, as a, a, from another perspective. Um, Kathy, who have you found sort of similar um, experiences um, in Bermuda and, and things, especially with the economy and how that's impacting on people's perception or involvement with our There's There's no university there, so um, that would make a, a big difference. And the college, is a, it's a junior college, um, and I don't actually know if anybody's ever taught any archaeology courses there. There may have been um, Clarence Max, well he's, he's a, a, an historian anyway, but he's um, quite involved in the in the history in some archaeology product, projects and he's involved in the National Museum of Bermuda there now. I wouldn't say that it's so much, that of course there, there are yeah. economic problems, but I think they're very um, acutely aware and tuned to culture and, um, and history and especially black history. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's ever been framed in terms of archaeology and it's it's weird because Bermuda has quite a big role in archaeology, considering it's where Ed Harris is from and where he lives and where he's worked most of his life. Um, and yet, you know, the people who are training in archaeology, there's a younger generation that's, um, well, actually, they're not a the younger generation, but they're recently uh, gaining PhDs and, and masters and, and undergraduates in archaeology. They're all white. Um, and from the responses to my survey, I can see that it's sort of never really entered uh, the heads of, um, you know, some black people that this is something that they might do. So it's not just a matter of the economics of it, it's just kind of, and I, I think doing the talk and doing the survey was actually the, you know, opened that up. So that was quite um, an interesting thing that, that that's actually the engagement that, that worked, well, hopefully it'll work. Um, 
because I don't know whether they've had archaeology presented in a way that says, hey, do you want to be involved, except for coming in being involved in digs. You know, you know, people take on volunteers for digs all the time. But I don't think anybody's directly addressed the fact that, hey, why are we all white? Why are all the, why are all the leaders in this field white? And, you know, um, you're just kind of presenting information in a kind of authoritative fashion without inviting other people to actually get up on the stage. Yeah. I find it really interesting that you can go to countries in the Caribbean where populations are predominantly black and they're still not teaching black history in, in schools and universities. Mm. Um, so you'd think that that was kind of a, an English or British problem, um, and it is, but that British problem is being replicated in former colonies. Um, so um, do you think, perhaps like Zena, maybe, do you think if we start to address um, or sort of decolonize our curriculum that won't that would also have an impact here but you know in other places too uh yes i think potentially um one of the um slight bugbears i probably have around the current um decolonizing agenda in um academia is that the focus is solely on the curriculum mm -hmm. um and uh i think if we only kind of attend to that bit uh we'll never actually fix the many other structural issues um, that are problematic and really it runs from everything from who you put on your reading list and that's important and it needs to change but it's right up to also who is allowed visas um, and uh, yeah and everything in between so um, so potentially yes to curriculum but go beyond do more than that. <laughs> um, so did you have a question? It's a slight spoiler, but okay. I'm not aging, so <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, based on all the things that everyone's saying, which I agree with and find hugely interesting, um, my position in terms of decolonial approaches to museums and archaeology is that race was the central project of both of, of both the subject of archaeology and museums being the repository for the stuff. So they took the stuff away and put it in the museums, and the reason for collecting the stuff was to demonstrate, some, to some degree or the other, the superiority of white people. And I think it's very good that that has now been stripped out of the discipline. Um, but my experience as an undergraduate 20 years ago was that we talked around it and never about the thing itself. So I wonder how you all feel about, we need to bring it back in, I think, because otherwise you have people like me, just like, we feel like we're treading water, we don't know what, where we're going or what we're swimming in. Um, but how can we go about doing that and addressing the issue without reverting to the original racism in the first place? Uh, Ideally. So um, uh, this was one of the kind of yeah. issues that I've been playing around. So for a while I was just kind of tinkering around in current courses and putting a bit here and a bit there and that never seemed enough. Um, so three years ago I designed a, a specific course, um, MA level, for um, to look at kind of issues around ethics and politics. Um, it's my absolute favourite course to teach. Uh, I love it. Um, uh, the students get really engaged. Um, uh, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but those students tend to be students of colour as well. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's almost like a form of therapy for all of us in the room that we actually have a space where we can talk about this. And in conversations I've had um, just this last week with students where they're like, this is like nothing I've ever had before and I've never been able to, to speak in this way before and air all of these thoughts that are going around my head so yeah those courses are really important. Um, Can I just add I think it goes deeper than that um, I, I, religion is really important it wasn't just it was for the white race actually it was for northern Europeans because southern Europeans were slightly dodgier yes. but also it was very much an Anglican it was very much yeah. Protestant affair and I think that often gets marginalized um, just been looking at some records of a, of a botanist and it's really interesting he's sort of if you're french it's okay that's good but if you're spanish a bit superstitious and you know really quite dodgy um and and i think that needs to be brought much more in as well and unfortunately i think i think that's increasingly problematic because you've got a lot of people of color who are also christians and then it go, that where do you sit then if you're a protestant christian where does that sit when actually a lot of colonialism was very much a Protestant mission. It's all part of the same thing, though. I, th I feel, I certainly agree that religion is, is part of it, but um, 
I understand what you're saying when you say religion is marginalized, but so many colonial <coughs> attitudes um, that we, we now th throw back at people of color who've lived throughout the former colonies, uh, the, 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 their ways of thinking, homophobia is the most obvious one, are down to Christian ways of thinking. Traditional Christian ways Traditional. of thinking, I, yeah. I do yeah. Pardon, yes, absolutely. And so to, to me, it's, it's part of the same mm. project. And uh, <coughs> something that's occurred to me recently, having visited a church, um, Forgotten which it was a cathedral of some description, possibly in Winchester, might have been Winchester Cathedral. Um, <laughs> going on the tour there, the history that was evident in that tour was the history I learned at school. Mm. So the history I learned at school is the history of the Anglican Church. These are these kings, these are these queens, these are the things they did for the church, this is why we know who they are. If we extend that story further, I completely agree with you, then there's a huge amount more to learn. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And actually it's a Roman Catholic space. It's it's not even an Anglican building. Yes, exactly. it's it's full of Roman Catholic stuff and they're they're ignoring that. Mm -hmm. There's a real if it is Winchester, there's a really strong connection with medieval Judaism, that's marginalised. Not hear that story, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so you know, yeah, I'm I'm working on working on that at the cathedral at the moment. Any other questions from the uh, okay. I just wondered the digital work that you're doing could potentially be, or maybe it is being integrated into other digital projects that are based in UK, and sort of how do those projects might speak to each other in a sort of helpful way? That's the conversation Laura and I are about yeah. to have after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because also Louise raised some um, really good points um, earlier about, um, uh, about our area of archaeology. Well, and the map that you had of Fitzrovia um, mapping all the kind of sites associated um, with slavery. And it made me actually think of a project that Niall's working on. It's called Sensing Place, um, um, which uh, enables um, people to kind of walk around their environment and look at, um, uh, I guess, the historic environment and, um, and uh, record how they feel. Um, about certain environments, but it would be really good to kind of, and it's a, it's a digital platform, it's GIS based, but if you had um, information like you had on this kind of Fitzrovia sort of placed into that same platform, you could get a really good understanding about how different mm -hmm. communities are engaging um, in those. Well, the rollout was last year in East London amongst uh, predominantly Somali and Bengali primary school children. Um, and we, we trialled this using a disposable camera. I know this sounds very clunky, but what we did was we gave them disposable cameras that we then developed so we could control the image process, obviously, which we then scanned in and we're working on that. And the idea is that you have a, essentially, rather than what is it, which is really, really quite obvious, it's a, a Twitter feed of characters that give you some indication about what you feel about the place, what it means to you. We can then start looking at discourse analysis if you want to take it further as an analysis of, of how people perceive their sense of place. And for, for helping integrate refugee communities into somewhere like East London, to help them know, for example, where's the doctor's surgery, where do they go for help, things like this. It's just a, a way of getting you familiar with your environment before we even start talking about heritage and things like that. So we're sort of hoping that we've got <laughs> some other application. Can I just go back to the, the, the previous question? Because actually, if I understand your question to say, how can we change and sort of keep change and make proper change mm -hmm. and not, you know, sort of pretend to make superficial changes, I think the only way is to get people of colour into leadership positions within the discipline. It's the only way. There's no point in people like me going, yeah, so it's, you know, and, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not the point. So I guess that was one of the things that my survey was trying to, to find out as well, sort of, you know, what did people think, and try, trying to beat around the bush in order to get that question in a way. I mean, that's why I think maybe a pointed question, <coughs> what do you think would be useful? But I did ask questions like, what would be important to you if you were to train, consider training as, a, as an archeologist? Um, and tried to rank things like, uh, whether it was finances, whether it was family support, and things like that. Now, finances did come out quite high as you might expect and, and training courses and things like that. So it's it's the obvious, the usual suspect. But you know, I mean I know that in, in Oxford they've you know put in place some um, some financial packages to support this kind of thing. Glasgow's doing a lot. That kind of support measure I think is is really important. Just got to keep applying pressure to do that.